All right, welcome to Pre-Calc with Mrs. Hill. And in this first chapter that we're going to be covering, we are going to be reviewing topics that you have covered in both Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and some geometry, and go over some things that um, are going to be really helpful for you to know to make, um, to be successful in pre-calculus. So starting out today, we are going to review real numbers, what are they? We're going to talk about interval notation, which you've not seen before, and how we use that with our inequality notation that you've often seen. We're going to review properties of exponents. We're going to review distance formula, midpoint formula, and also equations of circles. The nice thing about watching this video is that if at any point I go too fast at something, you can easily pause it, rewind it, um, just stop the video if you need to, but please make sure that you do watch the video in its entirety because you never know when I may have you um, do something, bring it in for class, um, or you know have something prepared for the next day. So let's go ahead and get started. And again, if at any point you need to pause this video, rewind it, watch it again, please feel free to do so. So reviewing what real numbers are. Hopefully you have seen, if you've been in my class, you've seen this diagram many times. Um, we're talking about real numbers, and real numbers, if you remember, it's any number that can be found on the number line. So any number on there, it's a real number. Now those real numbers we're going to break down, and we're going to break them down into rational, irrational, integers, whole numbers, natural numbers. And a lot of these you're going to see used over the next couple of months, and you just want to be able to recognize what they are saying as part of the directions. So let's go ahead and go back to kindergarten and let's talk about our natural numbers. And natural numbers are those counting numbers that you started with. So when you were counting uh, the cows in the, on the farm, you were count, starting with one, two, three, four, five. You did not know what zero was at that time. So those are natural numbers. Then you started learning about, well, what happens if there is none of something? Well, then you start including zero. So we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and those are our whole numbers. Next, you got into elementary school, and they started talking about negative numbers. And those, um, those are including our integers. So positive or negative whole numbers are integers. Notice that there are no fractions, there are no decimals. Everything here is a whole number, but you're including the positives and the negatives also along with 0. Then we got a little bit more complicated and we started looking at fractions. Rational numbers are numbers that can be written as a fraction. So I've got a bunch of different examples here. Two-thirds, obviously it's written as a fraction there. 0.25, we can write that as a fraction of one-fourth. Even a whole number or an integer like six can be written as six over one. Square roots, square root of 81 is nine, so we can write that as nine over one. Um, you've got a couple different options for that. So those are rational numbers. If a number cannot be written as a fraction, then you're talking about an irrational number. Probably the most famous one is pi, and the fact that you cannot write pi as a decimal. Um, square root of 2 goes on forever. We have a lot of different um, that, a lot of square roots that are going to be those irrational numbers. However, all of these can still be found on the number line, so therefore they're real numbers. Um, we'll talk about the number e down the road, and you might remember that from Algebra 2 with working with logarithms and exponential functions, but we'll be coming back with that. So that's just a quick review of real numbers. Next thing that I want to review with you is interval notation and then our in inequality notation. You are used to seeing everything written as inequalities. And as you'll notice here, I have three examples using greater than or less than signs, and those are going to be our inequalities that we're looking at. Remember that when we're graphing them out on number lines, we use open circles when we do not want to include the value. So if x is greater than 3, I use an open circle and I talk about the values that are greater than that, so I fill it into the right. X is less than or equal to negative 4, so I've got a filled in circle and I'm going to go to the left. For my last example here of negative, X is greater than negative 5 and X is less than or equal to 7, 
I would have an open circle at negative 5, I would have a closed circle at positive 7, and I would have the values in between filled in. So there's our, you know, our inequalities that we've used in the past. What's going to be introduced to you now is looking at interval notation, which is slightly different. Um, as far as graphing it out, you're going to notice that your book does this, so that's why I want to go over it. I am not picky over which one you choose to you choose to use. I will prefer that you use the um, inequalities rather than the intervals, though, once we get moving forward. But realize that your book uses both of them. So x is greater than 3. Rather than having an open circle and filled into the right, what they're going to use here is they're going to use a parenthesis. And then they're going to fill it in to the right. So rather than an open circle, a parenthesis is being used. Um, if it is a less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, we're going to use a bracket. So x is less than or equal to negative 4, so I'm going to use a bracket, and then I'm going to fill it in to the left. So with the last one here, x is greater than negative 5 and x is less than or equal to 7, I would have a parenthesis at negative 5. I'm going to put a bracket at positive 7, and I'm going to fill in the values in between. So this is using our interval notation. Now there's another way of using interval notation rather than using the inequalities themselves. And it kind of helps looking at this. Notice that at po positive 3 right here we have the parenthesis. Well, another way of writing this statement of x is greater than 3, they will write it as 3 with a parenthesis to the left, comma, positive infinity, um, parenthesis. And what this is doing here is this is saying that this is on the interval from 3 to infinity. And the parenthesis right here is saying that we do not want to include the 3. If I look at the next example here, I want everything that's less than or equal to negative 4. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go from negative infinity to 4, and I'm going to have a parenthesis on the left but a bracket on the right. Negative infinity tells me the direction in which we are going. So I'm going from negative infinity to 4, and we want to include 4. If I look at the last one here, I have, I'm going in between two of them. So I'm starting at negative 5, and I'm going to positive 7. Well, because I do not want to include negative 5, I use a parenthesis. And because I want to include 7, I use a bracket. So this is just the same thing as saying x is greater than negative 5, but less than or equal to 7. A lot of people do like this notation, but this notation using the inequalities really tells me that you understand what is being um, asked of you, uh, what, it, what um, range of numbers you're working with. Next, I want to get into um, reviewing the properties of exponents. This is something that you are expected to remember how to use, so I do want you to be aware of that, that I am holding you accountable for some things. Um, remember that when you are multiplying two powers together that have the same base, we add the exponents. So this is x to the power of m plus n. If I'm taking a power to a power, I am going to multiply these two together, so that's x to the power of m times n. If I'm dividing two powers with the same base, I can subtract the exponents. So this is x to the power of m minus n. Anything to the power of 0 is always going to give us 1. And when you have a negative exponent, we write that as 1 over x to the positive value of m. So those are the properties. Now just to kind of look at a couple examples real quick. Here if you have x squared times x to the third, really what you're doing here is you're taking x times x times x times x times x. You're taking 2x's times 3x's. With repeated multiplication, that's what exponents are, giving us x to the fifth power x squared to the third power, you're taking x squared and you're multiplying it by itself three times. So if I take x times x times x times x times x times x, I end up with six x's being multiplied together. That's the same thing as x to the sixth, two times three. 
x to the fifth divided by 3. I have 5x's in my numerator, 3x's uh, in my denominator. And one thing that happens when you are dividing something, it cancels and go to, goes to 1. Anything divided by itself is 1. And so here, we're going to end up with 1 times 1 times 1 times x times x. Well, 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times x is x. x times x gives you x squared. 5 minus 3 gives me that same 2. Now, if we end up with the same number of x's in our numerator versus, as our denominator, they are all going to cancel out and give us 1's. So we have 1 times 1 times 1, which gives me oops, 1. Now, here working with our property from um, up above here when we subtract, 3 minus 3 gives us 0. So we get x to the power of 0, which is always going to give us 1. If you have a larger exponent in your denominator here, so I've got 3x's in the numerator, and I have 5 in the denominator. As I cancel out, you'll notice that I have 1 times 1 times 1 times, and then you've got 1 over x times 1 over x. If you're looking at this, here I end up with 1 over x squared. So a lot of times what people will do is they'll say, oh, 3 minus 5 is negative 2, bring it down into the denominator. Or sometimes people can see that there's more x's in the denominator than there are the numerator. All right, let me see where we're at time-wise. So 11 minutes, we're doing okay. Um, I just want to cover over three more things to review. And the first one is hopefully you remember that wonderful distance formula from geometry that you use like 500 times. So there's our distance formula. The distance formula, um, really where it comes from is the Pythagorean theorem. And Pythagorean theorem uses a right triangle. And it allows you to find the distance of the hypotenuse, which is D, using A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So you got your two legs that you can work from. So you could use the Pythagorean theorem, or we can use our distance formula that we have here. So I have my two points. Um, I'm going to use my point over here to the left, so this is going to be x1 and this is going to be y1. Here's x2 and this is y2, and I'm going to go ahead and fill everything in. So I'm taking the square root of the quantity of x2 minus x1, so 4 minus a negative 5, that value squared, plus y2, which is 2, subtract y1, which is 5, take that value squared. 4 minus a negative 5, so that gives me 9. So 9 squared plus negative 3 squared. So I'm going to get the square root of 81 plus the square root of 9. Be careful, negative number squared is always positive. And then I end up with the square root here of 90. Now when we're working with things um, with pre-calc, I am going to expect that you simplify things. Sometimes you will have answers that are approximate. Other times you're going to have answers that are exact. In a situation like this, say I want to find the exact value, I would want you to simplify the square root of 90. Remembering how we can do that is we can break this up into two squares. Um, think of factors that multiply together, you get 90, one of them being a perfect square, so 9 times 10. And then I end up with three square roots of 10. There we are. Um, I don't have calculator on me, but we can check it out real quick. Uh, we got to go to a different scientific. Um, if we wanted to find the approximate value here, we could take 90 and then my square root. You guys are probably seeing it faster than I am. There it is. So 9.49. Always round at least two decimals um, if you are rounding. And so there's our exact value and the approximate. The other formula that you talked a lot about in um, geometry is finding the midpoint. And the midpoint is figuring out to really the point that's in the middle of your two points that are there. So we need to find the same distance from here.
Our midpoint formula that we have takes as your two x coordinates, adds them together, divides it by two, take two y values, add them together, divide them by two, and you will have your midpoint. So our x values that we have, we have negative five plus four, take all that divided by two, and our y values, so five plus two divided by two, here I end up with negative one divided by two, so ne negative one half. Five plus two is seven. Seven divided by two is seven halves. So my midpoint is negative one half and seven halves. And the last and final thing that we're going to talk about is the equation of a circle. Um, this is going to come up periodically, but just something to kind of have in your notes so you can look for it at some point. Um, equation of a circle really comes from the distance formula. Um, which comes from the Pythagorean theorem. And because when you're talking about a circle, you have the center. And the center to any point on the circle is the radius. And that's really a distance. So if you wanted to go from the center of your circle to the outside of the circle, you're talking about the distance. And that's where our formula comes in here. And the point that's in the middle would never change. It's the points that are around the circle that are going to change. So those would be like our x's and y's. So hk that we use up in our equation up here, that's going to be our center, and r is our radius, since that's the distance from the center to the circle. So in my problem here, since my center is negative 1, negative 3, this is telling me that h is negative 1, and k is negative 3. And my radius, um, if I look at my problem here, I can count it out. It's one, two, three, four, five units. So my radius is going to be five. Plugging in all of this now, we can end up with our equation of the quantity of x. Oops, sorry. x minus a negative one. Take that quantity squared plus y minus a negative 3 squared equals 5 squared. Now since I'm subtracting a negative 1, we're going to write that as x plus 1 squared, and y minus a negative 3, we're going to write, write that as y plus 3 squared. 5 squared is 25, and now I have my equation of my circle. So in what was it, 17 minutes here, we have gone over quite a few things. Um, if there are any questions on anything, make sure that you write them down. If something didn't quite make sense, make sure that you go back and watch it again. Otherwise, um, if you do not have any questions, we'll see you in class.